In our first film, Emission Controls Part 1, we looked at a number of the emission control systems used on AMC and Jeep vehicles. In this film, we'll study the rest of the systems. In the film itself, we'll look at the function of each system, as well as its theory of operation. In the film reference book, you'll find the service procedures required to keep the systems in top operating condition. Before we get into our next system, let's look at the relationship between distributor spark advance, power output, and combustion temperature. This chart reveals an important fact. When ignition timing is over advanced to a certain point, power output increases and so does combustion temperature. But if timing is over advanced past this point, power output levels off then begins to drop. But combustion temperature continues to increase. So too much spark advance serves only to increase combustion temperature. And we now know that higher combustion temperatures are accompanied by higher levels of nitrous oxides. This excessive emission of nitrogen oxides is eliminated by several types of spark control systems on AMC and Jeep vehicles. Shown here is the spark coolant temperature override, or CTO system. In this system, intake manifold vacuum provides full spark advance when the engine is cold. This full advance condition results in better drivability during engine warm-up. However, when the engine warms up, carburetor-ported vacuum advances the spark. The heart of the system is the CTO switch. This is the component that routes either intake manifold vacuum or carburetor-ported vacuum to the distributor advance mechanism. It makes this choice based on engine coolant temperature. Here, the engine temperature is less than 160 degrees. The spring on the plunger holds the plunger in this position. The lower O-ring is held against its seat, so intake manifold vacuum is routed out port D to the distributor advance mechanism. As we said, this full spark advance enhances drivability during warm-up. Now the engine has warmed up. The coolant temperature has increased to about 160 degrees, causing the temperature of the wax power element to increase. The wax has expanded, forcing the piston upward. Now the upper O-ring blocks off intake manifold vacuum, while carburetor-ported vacuum is routed to the distributor advance mechanism. So now the vacuum advance is controlled by throttle opening. This CTO switch is used on some vehicles equipped with heavy-duty cooling systems. In some applications, this heavy-duty switch is used in series with the standard switch we just saw. The standard CTO switch is connected to manifold and carburetor-ported vacuum, as it is when used by itself. But instead of routing vacuum to the distributor, it routes it to a port on the heavy-duty cooling switch. The heavy-duty cooling switch is also connected to a manifold vacuum source. As you can see, this switch ultimately decides which type of vacuum is routed to the distributor advance mechanism. Let's see how this system works. Here, the engine temperature is less than 160 degrees. The standard CTO switch routes manifold vacuum to the heavy-duty CTO switch. The heavy-duty switch plunger is in its down position so this manifold vacuum is routed to the distributor. Now the engine temperature has reached 160 degrees. The standard CTO switch has made its internal shift and carburetor ported vacuum is routed to the heavy duty cooling switch. The heavy duty cooling switch has not made its internal shift, so it routes this ported vacuum to the distributor. Now though the engine temperature has exceeded the normal operating range and has reached 220 degrees. Sensing this, the heavy-duty cooling CTO has made its shift. The ported vacuum is blocked off and manifold vacuum is routed directly through the heavy-duty cooling CTO to the distributor. This full spark advance increases the engine idle speed. As a result, engine cooling is improved and idling boiling tendencies are reduced. On some newer vehicles equipped with heavy-duty cooling systems, a dual-function CTO switch is used in place of the two-switch system. Let's check it out. 
Here the engine temperature is less than 149 degrees. To provide better drivability during warm-up, manifold vacuum is routed to the distributor advance mechanism. Remember that full spark advance is now applied. Now the engine has warmed to about 149 degrees. The expanding wax power element has forced the plunger up into the position shown here. Intake manifold is blocked and carburetor ported vacuum is directed to the distributor advance mechanism. This continues until the engine temperature reaches 220 degrees. Now the carburetor ported vacuum is blocked and intake manifold vacuum is once again directed to the distributor advance mechanism. The full spark advance increases engine idle speed, which improves engine cooling efficiencies and reduces idling boiling tendencies. Here's another device that directs vacuum to the distributor advance mechanism on some AMC and Jeep vehicles, the nonlinear vacuum regulator valve. This unit operates quite differently from the CTO switches. First, it provides vacuum based on engine load rather than engine temperature. Also, the regulator can provide a vacuum signal somewhere between carburetor ported vacuum and intake manifold vacuum. Here the engine is idling. Manifold vacuum is high and ported vacuum is either very low or non-existent. The regulator valve is providing a signal somewhere between the two levels. As the engine load increases, the regulator valve gradually switches to ported vacuum only. The last spark control system we'll study is used on a small percentage of vehicles. The transmission controlled spark system, or TCS system, also helps reduce the emission of nitrogen oxides by lowering the combustion temperature. It does this by limiting spark advance at low speeds. This system utilizes manifold and ported vacuum, a basic CTO switch, a solenoid vacuum valve, and a solenoid control switch, which is connected to the transmission. Here the engine temperature is less than 160 degrees, and the vehicle road speed is below a calibrated level. As we've already seen, the CTO switch senses the cold coolant temperature and will allow only intake manifold vacuum to pass to the distributor advance mechanism. Note that because the control switch is closed, the vacuum valve is not allowing ported vacuum to pass to the CTO switch. Now the vehicle is operating at a higher speed. As you can see, the control switch is now open. On vehicles equipped with automatic transmissions, the switch is opened by transmission governor oil pressure. On vehicles equipped with manual transmissions, the control switch is opened mechanically when high gear is engaged. The result is the same, though. The ground to the vacuum valve is broken, and ported vacuum is routed to the CTO switch. But this doesn't affect the operation of the CTO switch at all. Gauging that the coolant temperature is still low, the CTO switch will only allow manifold vacuum to pass to the advance mechanism. The engine has now warmed to about 160 degrees, and the high speed is being maintained. The solenoid vacuum valve is still allowing carburetor ported vacuum to pass to the CTO switch. Sensing the warmer coolant temperature, the CTO has made its internal shift, allowing the carburetor vacuum to advance the spark. Now the driver has slowed down to a speed below the calibration level of the control switch. So the switch has closed, grounding the vacuum valve. Carburetor vacuum is now blocked. Remember that the CTO switch still wants to provide ported carburetor vacuum to the distributor advance mechanism, but none is available. So, when a warm engine is being run at low speeds, no spark advance takes place. As a result, combustion temperatures and NOx emissions are reduced. On some vehicles equipped with transmission-controlled spark, this vacuum spark control check valve is added. As we've seen, manifold vacuum applies the spark when the engine is cold. But if the engine is accelerated, manifold vacuum drops and vacuum advance is lost. The check valve, however, traps the strong vacuum between the check valve and the CTO switch. The distributor remains in the full advance mode until the CTO switches to ported vacuum. 
The trapped vacuum slowly bleeds down when the engine isn't running. Stop the projector and read pages 2 through 8 in the reference book. Take the quiz, then turn the projector back on. Our next system is the Exhaust Gas Recirculation, or EGR, system. As we know, nitrogen oxides are formed as a result of high combustion temperatures. The EGR system limits the formation of these pollutants by diluting the intake charge with a metered amount of exhaust gas. The blue arrows here represent the exhaust gas. As you can see, the exhaust gas mixes with the fuel air charge, represented by the green and yellow arrows. The entire mixture enters the combustion chamber. The exhaust gas will not burn, therefore the peak temperature of the gases in the combustion chamber are lower. Here are the components that make up the EGR system. The EGR valve with built-in back pressure sensor and a two-port CTO switch which uses carburetor ported vacuum. The exhaust gas recirculation process does not take place until the engine has warmed to a calibrated level and the engine load is sufficient to permit proper EGR operation. Let's start out with the CTO switch. One port, the S port, connects to the carburetor ported vacuum source. The E port connects to the EGR valve. Here the coolant temperature is low, so the CTO switch does not pass any vacuum to the EGR valve. Therefore, no exhaust gas recirculation takes place when the engine's cold. On some engines, the CTO switch opens at 115 degrees and has a black body. On others, the CTO switch opens at 85 degrees and has a white body. The coolant temperature has now reached a calibrated level. The CTO switch senses this and the carburetor ported vacuum is routed out the E port to the EGR valve. Let's see what goes on at the EGR valve. This is the EGR valve with an internal back pressure sensor. There are two diaphragms in this valve, a power diaphragm and a control diaphragm. There's a bleed valve in the power diaphragm, as you can see. The pintle is the component that allows the exhaust gas to enter the intake manifold. Here we have vacuum to the EGR valve but no exhaust gas recirculation is taking place. There is low exhaust back pressure in the exhaust manifold. This low pressure travels up the hollow pintle stem and pushes against the control diaphragm. The opposing spring force is stronger, however, so the vacuum bleeds out the bleed valve to the atmosphere. The pintle remains against its seat, blocking the passage to the intake manifold. Now, the exhaust back pressure has increased. This pressure has overcome spring tension against the control diaphragm, and the control diaphragm has been forced up, blocking the bleed valve. Full vacuum is now applied to the power diaphragm, and the attached pintle has been pulled up away from its seat. Exhaust gas recirculation can now take place. Some older vehicles utilize an EGR valve with an external back pressure sensor. Here's what that system looks like. The EGR valve mounts on the back pressure sensor spacer, which is joined by a metal tube to the sensor valve. The sensor valve regulates vacuum between the CTO switch and the EGR valve. The restrictor plate, which is located between the spacer and the intake manifold, is calibrated for specific application. Incidentally, you may also see a restrictor plate utilized on some vehicles equipped with an internal back pressure sensor. When there's low exhaust back pressure in the intake manifold, the sensor valve will not allow vacuum to pass to the EGR valve. As you can see here, the engine is warm and the sensor valve is receiving vacuum from the CTO switch. But there is not enough back pressure to induce the valve to pass this vacuum to the EGR valve. The diaphragm spring keeps the pintle in its seat, so no exhaust gas recirculation is taking place. Now the back pressure is high. The sensor has allowed vacuum to pass to the EGR valve. The diaphragm has been pulled up by the vacuum pulling the pintle off its seat in the process. Exhaust gas recirculation is now occurring. One very important point in regard to the restrictor plate 
is this identification number. If you replace a restrictor plate, be sure the replacement bears the same number as the original. Here's another variation of the EGR system. This system features a thermal vacuum switch located in the air cleaner. Based on air cleaner temperature, the TVS switch controls the vacuum passage between the CTO switch and the EGR valve. Here, the CTO switch wants to route vacuum to the EGR valve because coolant temperature is high enough. But first, the vacuum must pass through the TVS switch. As you can see by the frigid green arrows, the air is very cold. The TVS switch senses this and blocks vacuum to the EGR valve. Now, exhaust gas recirculation can't take place and cold drivability is enhanced. Now the incoming air has warmed up. The TVS switch now connects its two ports and vacuum is routed to the EGR valve. Now, if there is sufficient exhaust back pressure at the sensor in the EGR valve, exhaust gas recirculation can take place. Stop the projector and read pages 9 through 12 in the reference book. Take the quiz, then turn the projector back on. Now, let's check out another emissions control system, the fuel vapor control system. This system prevents raw vapors, which contain unburned hydrocarbons, from escaping into the atmosphere. Basically, this system stores vapors gathered from the carburetor and fuel tank, then routes these vapors into the combustion chamber when the engine is started. When the vehicle is not running, vapors from the fuel tank and carburetor bowl are stored in the storage canister. As you can see here, the storage canister contains charcoal, that absorbs the vapors onto the surface of the charcoal granules. But let's back up a minute and trace the paths the vapors must take to get this far. To get to the storage canister, tank vapors must pass through a rollover check valve. On some vehicles, the vapors must also pass through a liquid check valve. Let's take a quick look at these components. The liquid check valve prevents liquid fuel from reaching the canister. This unit contains a float and needle assembly, as you can see here. It will allow vapors to pass freely, but if liquid fuel should for any reason reach the liquid check valve, the liquid fuel forces the float up and the needle is seated. The liquid can't go any further. The vapors also pass through the rollover check valve on their way from the fuel tank to the storage canister. This device prevents fuel flow from the tank in the event of vehicle rollover. Here, everything is normal, and the vapors pass through the valve. If the vehicle flips over and liquid fuel gets as far as the rollover check valve, the stainless steel ball forces the plunger to seat. Fuel flow is now shut off. On some vehicles, vapors from the carburetor must pass through a liquid trap on their way to the canister. This trap prevents liquid fuel from getting to the canister. Note that when the vehicle is started, this trap is purged of its vapors. The vapors are purged from the canister by a staged dual purge system. When the engine is started, intake manifold vacuum pulls the vapors from the canister and liquid trap into the manifold, where they are directed to the combustion chambers. When carburetor ported vacuum reaches a certain level, as it has on the right here, the secondary purge circuit is opened and the canister is purged at a much higher rate. A small percentage of vehicles utilize this carburetor bowl cooling system. After engine shutdown, this system automatically cools the carburetor bowl when the underhood temperature is above a predetermined temperature. This reduces fuel percolation and the associated release of hydrocarbons into the atmosphere. Well, that's it. We've seen all of the emissions control systems used on AMC and Jeep vehicles in these two films. The PCV system, the automatic choke, catalytic converters, the thermostatically controlled air cleaner, air guard, the vacuum throttle modulating system, the various spark control systems, EGR, the fuel vapor control system, and finally, the carburetor bowl cooling system.
Yes, we've covered a lot of ground. I hope you've picked up some info you can put to use on the job because emission controls are here to stay and it's up to you and me to see that the systems on our vehicles remain in top operating condition. Don't forget to hold on to the film reference books from both films. Now that you're familiar with the various systems, you can use the reference books as information sources when you're servicing the systems. Also remember that your technical service manuals provide complete application and service information for the emission control systems.